let us hear from the Gospel of John, probably the core story about Mary Magdalene from the 20th chapter. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and did you not know where they have laid him? Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in. And when he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. And then the disciples returned to their own home. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And when she saw two angels in white, where there was the body of Jesus that had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. May these words be to us our light and our life. Thanks be to God. The church that I grew up in was a good church. It taught me well. It raised me well. But the church that I grew up in did not have many women in major leadership roles. And there was no woman pastor. As a matter of fact, that would have been quite extraordinary for a Presbyterian church in the 1960s and 70s. Ah, the good old days. What my childhood church did have was a very strong youth fellowship in which I was deeply involved. And this youth ministry significantly shaped and formed my faith and my spiritual understanding. And as I headed off to college all grown up, it had been made very clear to me in that youth fellowship that I was not merely pursuing an academic endeavor, nor was I just preparing for some future career that would pay a good living wage. No, I was seeking a vocation. God's calling for my life. Well, going to the University of Kansas, I can't tell you how that raised the bar. It's not something you can exactly share with the admissions director there. But this was pressed upon me, and I carried it. Even so, as I was searching and wondering and studying hard and learning in the field that seemed the most appropriate for me at the time, even so, my mainstream Protestant theologically traditional pastor actually suggested to me that he saw gifts in me for ministry and I should consider seeking and following the path to ordination as a possibility for my future. 
And my reaction quite out loud was, girls can't be pastors. And he laughed and said, oh, you're right, but women can. <laughs> well, I still couldn't get this head around, my head around this idea. And it took over three years from the time he suggested it to the time that it really became a possibility. My pastor was determined. He introduced me to a Presbytery colleague, Susan Thornton. She was the first woman pastor I had ever met. She was real. And she was short. <laughs> he also reintroduced me to another woman that I thought I knew, but no. And that was Mary Magdalene. This character in the Bible who appeared every Easter and only at Easter. My pastor opened her story to me in ways I had never before heard. And yet it was as clear as the words in the Bible. There she is, remembered as the first of Jesus' followers to witness him alive after the crucifixion. She was the first to speak with him, to hear his voice. She was the first one he sent to tell this good news that death did not have the last word. And my pastor told me that the title apostle literally means one who is sent. Mary Magdalene, he told me, was the apostle to the apostles. Cindy, he said, Jesus entrusted the fundamental event of our pr pr Christian proclamation to a woman. Well, for me this changed everything. Everything. Everything I had understood about being a woman who followed Jesus. About my vocation. About my calling. About what was possible even if I hadn't seen it. It gave me faith to believe in that which was not yet seen very much in the Presbyterian Church. And it was as if Mary stood right next to me and showed me this path to seminary and ordination and a life's vocation in ministry. So yes, when Adam gave me the choice I went, Mary Magdalene, please. But who is this woman? Who is this woman that we only pay attention to usually maybe once a year? What can we know about her? Well, her name identifies her as from the village of Magdala on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. That is the region where Jesus began his ministry. So right from the beginning, she is in proximity of him. The Gospel writer Luke tells that Jesus and the twelve named disciples, there were others. Jesus and the twelve were accompanied among those others by several women, and they included Mary Magdalene. And these women supported Jesus and his ministry and the people around him out of their means. Mary was a patron. She was a donor to Jesus' mission. So that would tell us she was a woman of some means that she could afford not only her money but her time. We learn that Jesus had cured Mary of seven demons. And whether that was a literal demon possession or a myriad of physical ment and mental illnesses, as some scholars believe, we can really only speculate because that's all we know. And you know what? To me, it doesn't matter. What does matter is that Jesus healed Mary and transformed her life and freed her. And it was so dramatic and such a change for her that she dedicated herself to his mission. She even followed him away from her hometown all the way to Jerusalem. Now that's about all we know. And the rest of Mary's life and her ministry is somewhat of a mystery. But there's a few myths out there I would like to dispel. 
One is that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. And that's just one of the many depictions that is put forward about her over the centuries. And it was the 6th century Pope, that, Pope Gregory I, who got creative in a sermon and declared that Mary was the forgiven and reformed prostitute found in another story of scripture. Now the Catholic Church formally rejected this characterization of her in 1969. But I can tell you, I was in Sunday school years after that, and even in the Presbyterian Church, they're still, they were still teaching that myth. In popular culture, she has been characterized as a seductress, such as in Jesus' film, The Last Temptation of Christ. She was Jesus' wife as imagined in Dan Brown's book, The Da Vinci Code, or as some uh, promiscuous woman in one of my favorite operas, which is Jesus Christ Superstar, but it still makes me cringe. Likewise, in the movies The Passion of Christ, she is presented as this fallen one. And even as recently as 2016, that same image is perpetuated in the film Risen. I won't go see it. Maybe I should. But you see, Mary Magdalene is named at least 12 times across the four Gospels. And not one of those references supports these interpretations. Not one. Yet all of them credit her proximity to Jesus by eroticizing her. As if a sexual relationship is the only way that a woman can have a significant place in an important man's life. Now on the contrary, some early Christian writings remain that portray Mary Magdalene as a visionary who became a leader in the early church. And one of the writings that did not get into the official canon that is now our Bible is the second century Gospel of Mary. There are only fragments remaining of this writing. But it reveals this lost tradition about the leadership of Mary. Now this account may not be official, but it's a great read. One scene, one of my favorite scenes, took place on the Mount of the Ascension after Jesus had departed into this place called heaven. And the disciples, again, are disconsolate and depressed and ready to quit and afraid of everything. And Mary stands up and she addresses them all and she exhorts them to snap out of it. Stop grieving. She assured them that the grace of Christ would be with them and urged them to start preparing for the mission to which they had been called. And listening to her, the disciples took heart and they began to discuss Jesus' teaching and began to plan how they would share this with the world. Is this true? I don't know. My feminist heart would love to say, yes, let's get that story back in. But this we know. Mary is very present in the life of Jesus. Mary is remembered as being present in leadership in the early church. And I just have this skepticism that says, maybe all that mythology of the fallen woman and the prostitute was that later church's desire to kind of put her in her place. A lot of women over the years have been told to stay in their place. Sheryl Sandberg, who is the COO of Facebook, asked the question, what would you do if you were not afraid? And the title of her first book delivers her answer. Lean in. Lean in and do it. Sandberg addresses what she calls the leadership gap. That is between women's potential for leadership, all that they might offer, and the reality 
their reality that keeps that from happening. And she encourages women not to wait till the world finally paves the way, but to lean into it and to confront the forces around and within that would deter full participation. And as I read her book and I picked it up and read it again, what she described sounds a lot to me as what makes Mary Magdalene different from all those other followers of Jesus. While the others questioned and resisted and shied away and hid, Mary leaned in. She leaned into Jesus' ministry with her money and her time and her attention. She heard his preaching and his teaching and saw his acts of healing. She followed him to Jerusalem. She saw him arrested and humiliated. And while the others denied and ran away, Mary leaned right into Jesus' death and remained at the foot of the cross. A grievous and dangerous place to be. She witnessed his burial and returned two days later to tend to his body. And when she saw the open and empty tomb, she ran to report this to the disciples. And yes, they came running to see for themselves because guess what? They didn't believe her. They came running to see for themselves. And even after they came, they left and went home. And Mary remained. She stayed right there, not ready to accept this answer. And in the midst of her devastating grief, Jesus appeared to her and called her by her name. And that got her attention. And she recognized him. And her visceral reaction was to call him by the name that she knew. And it was not sweetheart or hubby. It was teacher. My teacher. And if you condense the whole word Rabonia, it means my great teacher. That's who Jesus was for Mary. Mary leaned in because as a follower of Jesus, she had learned from him. When he encountered suffering, he leaned in and he healed. When he found people hungry, he leaned in and he fed them. When his followers could not understand his teachings, he leaned in and he told them a story that might stick with them, that they could understand, if not now, maybe someday later. And when he saw the hypocrisy and the injustice of the religious and political leaders of his day, he leaned in and he rebuked it. And it cost him his life. This is what Mary witnessed. That's what she stayed close to. She leaned in. What would she do if she was not afraid? She did it. We can learn so much from Mary's lead and her devotion to Jesus and her courage to stay nearby. First, we can learn to overcome our fears. Ask yourself, what would you do if you were not afraid? Which begs the question, what are you afraid of? And Mary, like Sheryl Sandberg, would encourage us to that very thing. Go lean into it. Don't shy away from it. Don't avoid it. Don't act like it'll go away. Lean into it. Because that's where you will find Jesus waiting for you. What are you afraid of? Go directly into the space of our fear and find our way through. When our friend is sick or sad, so sick or sad that we don't know what to say and we're afraid that we are going to do the wrong thing and not be helpful. 
or when we are troubled by an estranged relationship, afraid that any attempt we might offer to reconcile with that person will lead to rejection and break our heart all over again. Mary would tell us, lean in. Lean in to those persons. Don't hold back. When we witness such injustice, inequity, and cruelty in the world around us, and we find ourselves afraid that our engagement might change our worldview, or it could cost us our reputation, or it could cost us our safety, Mary would tell us, don't run home, lean in. You are needed. We can also learn from the persistence of Mary Magdalene. Only she remained at the tomb. She didn't expect to see Jesus, but this persistent woman couldn't pull herself away. How often do we give up too easily? When we feel that our efforts are weak or the cost is too high, Mary would tell us to lean in. Way back in 1988, Heidi Vardaman and I were young pastors among a small handful of women pastors in the Presbytery of Southwest Florida. That's why I asked Corinne to cue her up in the introduction. Because yes, she got into more trouble than I did. Because I tended to be one of those go-by-the-system types that didn't want to cause trouble. That's still my default nature that I have to wrestle with. And Mary Magdalene says, snap out of it. When we were young pastors in the Presbytery of Southwest Florida, I was three months pregnant. I've been where Corinne is, filling the pulpit in a new way. And I, along with two other expecting pastors, had been appealing to our presbytery to establish a family leave policy. They didn't have such a thing back then. And the first attempt failed on the floor of presbytery after protracted and heated debate. And we moms-to-be were so frustrated. It felt like we were going to be working without a net. And to add insult to injury, someone passed us in the hall. We were standing together thinking, what do we do? We were hiding in our room, so to speak, just bemoaning. And this person passed us in the hall after that nay vote and softly sneered, you uppity women need to go home with your babies where you belong. Ah, the good old days. I felt so angry. I felt so defeated that I found myself fighting tears. Oh no. But there they were. And Heidi was there. And she came over and she linked her arm in mine and in another woman's and pulled us into a circle. Now those of you that know Heidi already can see this. Right? Pulled us in a circle and said, Sisters, uppity women wear it like a badge. He has no clue that we are just getting started. We talked to the stated clerk, who did not hold out hope for passage. Nevertheless, we persisted. And we leaned in, and we organized, and we found our allies, and we faced our detractors. And at the very next presbytery, the policy passed. Whew. One small victory for a few women in the presbytery. And I had a baby girl and six glorious weeks with her before I had to go back to work. Six. And more than that, more than the vacation of six weeks recovering and losing sleep, more than that, I had found this courage born of persistence and born of the women who stood together who went to the foot of the cross together where we were told nothing would happen. And I learned to advocate, not just for myself, but for all those others. Any of those others who would be marginalized by systems that want to maintain the status quo. Back in 1988, 
But most of all, I think Mary Magdalene has shown me and hopefully shown us how to keep faith. After Jesus' arrest, the predictable happens. Jesus' teaching and preparation is lost on the disciples in that moment. They quickly conclude that Jesus is gone and they are in danger. Better get back to fishing. Mary's actions at the cross and the tomb indicate that she had heard Jesus speak of his death. And she didn't deny it, she expected it. And she had participated right in it. And she was, in her own way, prepared. And her full participation, participation makes her able to recognize when Jesus was in her midst and called her name. Makes her able to proclaim the living Jesus. Makes her able to be the apostle to the apostles. Mary shows us that it's no mystery, it's quite simple. Lean in. Lean in and listen and practice Jesus' teaching. Practice caring about who and what God cares about and practice caring the way God cares. This is what Jesus' life demonstrates. And because she leans in and stays near Jesus, she ultimately teaches the other disciples and can teach us how to see him as well. Nothing was the same after that day. Nothing for her or for the disciples. And like us, when our old ways of believing become unbelievable, when there are those days when we wonder if our prayers are even being heard and if it's actually true, that God can turn darkness into light and overcome death with life. Or are we just fools for thinking so? Mary was standing right next to us. And she says to us, I have seen the Lord. Lean in. Stay near. Listen. Learn, she tells us. You will see him too. Amen.